Hi, I'm Charlene Theodore and I'll be your host for this installment of the OBA Foundation video series on dealing with spousal support. Today I'm joined by two family lawyers, Robert Scheuer and Megan O'Neill. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having us. Uh, my first question is for you, Robert. To start off, can you tell us what is spousal support? Thank you for the question, Charlene. Uh, spousal support is quite uh, interesting, and uh, the basic definition of spousal support is uh, money that's paid by one spouse to another after they have uh, separated or they've gotten divorced. You may have heard of the term uh, alimony, but that's an American term. In Canada, we use the term spousal support. We don't use the term alimony in Canada. They are Spousal support is a legal criteria which allows us to determine whether a, spousal, a spouse after separation or divorce should be receiving or paying spousal support, and if so, for how, how much and for how long. I'll ask this question to both of you, first you Robert and then you Megan. How do you know who is entitled to receive spousal support? Oh yes, uh, that's, uh, that can be a complicated question, but there are generally uh, three ways of uh, being entitled to uh, spousal support. The first and probably the least common way of being entitled to spousal support is uh, through contractual entitlement. And contractual entitlement is through a uh, marriage uh, contract that's signed by the parties prior to uh, getting married. And we also call that a cohabitation agreement, uh, and it predetermines that there will be spousal support entitlement or a lack of entitlement after uh, separation or divorce. It uh, can be used um, to predetermine how long spousal support will be paid for and how long. And the second way that someone can be entitled to receive spousal support is on the basis of compensation. Essentially, if a spouse has been economically disadvantaged by their role, that they assume during the relationship, they may be entitled to spousal support as compensation for the disadvantage they suffered. As an example, if a spouse quits their job to become a stay-at-home parent and remains out of the workforce for many years, they're presumably at a disadvantage to the other spouse who likely continued working and furthered their career. Should these spouses separate, the stay-at-home parent may be entitled to spousal support as compensation. We would call this compensatory support. And the third way that someone can become entitled to uh, spousal support is based on a uh, means and needs analysis. In the scenario of a means and needs analysis, uh, we examine whether one spouse needs spousal support in order to maintain a uh, certain lifestyle or to simply be able to uh, support themselves after separation and whether or not the other spouse has the uh, means to uh, pay uh, spousal support and still enjoy a certain level of lifestyle that they've been accustomed to in the past. And um, a similar type of lifestyle means to what the uh, family and the spouse have been accustomed to prior to separation. And uh, the other um, determination for means and, means and needs analysis is the income of the parties. The larger the discrepancy in the incomes between the uh, separating spouses, the uh, more likely there's going to be entitlement uh, to spousal support. And um, some of the factors that are examined in a means and uh, needs analysis are the roles that were assumed by the spouses during marriage, the age of the parties at separation, the ability of one spouse to uh, earn an income after separation, and other criteria that may influence the determination of uh, spousal support, such as who took the uh, most active role in raising the children. So how then, Megan, do you calculate both the quantum and the duration of spousal support? Well, to start off, we have now what are called the Spousal Support Advisory Guidelines, or the SAGs for short. These are a template formula with accompanying guidelines and instructions that were developed by two professors at the University of Toronto as a way to try and standardize spousal support calculations based on objective criteria. The SAGs provide significant guidance in determining the appropriate quantum and duration of spousal support, but they're guidelines only. To use the SAGs, you need to input some key facts like the length of re the relationship, the number of children, the age of the spouses, and their respective annual incomes. Once all of the key information has been inputted, the SAGs produce a range of recommended payments. Because the SAGs produce a range instead of one number, they can't give a full answer. It's important to meet with a lawyer to know where you might fall in the range. Okay, so I'm a spouse and I'm about to go see a lawyer to discuss spousal support. How can I best prepare for that meeting? Well, first of all, if there's a marriage contract or a um, 
or a domestic contract of some uh, description, bring it uh, with you to the lawyer. But the second thing you want to do is you want to bring as much uh, information as you can to the lawyer about uh, the incomes of the uh, parties and, uh, the, and the issues that uh, you're going to be um, dealing with during um, in the negotiations or if you're going to court. So the best way to uh, prepare for a meeting with a lawyer is to gather as much information about your case and about your specific um, need for spousal support and bring it with you uh, when you initially meet with a lawyer so you can talk to them about uh, your possible entitlement to spousal support. And when it comes to determining income, the starting place is always someone's personal income tax return and their notice of assessment. Line 150 of your income tax return sets out your personal income from all sources. For tax purposes, and for most people, that's the proper number to use for calculating spousal support. But, in other cases, calculating the proper income for spousal support can be a lot more complicated. Either way, if they're available, you should bring yours and your spouse's three most recent years of tax returns. And Robert, how is spousal support paid? Well, generally the rule of thumb is that it's paid on a uh, periodic basis, which uh, the courts have determined is on a uh, monthly basis. The other way that uh, spousal support is paid is on a uh, lump sum basis. If uh, spousal support is uh, paid on a periodic basis, it's going to be taxable to the uh, person who is receiving it and is going to be a credit to the person who is paying it. And if it's on a lump sum basis, then there is uh, no tax uh, implications. So that's how spousal support is generally paid in accordance um, with uh, court orders and domestic contracts. So as Robert said, taxation is an important consideration when it comes to spousal support. The fact that one kind of spousal support is taxable to the recipient and tax deductible to the payer, while one kind of support is tax neutral to both the recipient and the payer, means that you really need to be careful when dealing with spousal support. Often, recipients won't know or they'll forget that they're going to be taxed on the periodic spousal support payments that they receive and so they just spend the money as it's received and don't have the funds to pay the income tax. Are there any other common problems with spousal support? Well, one of them is that uh, people assume that spousal support is, uh, is paid for uh, for an indefinite or what they call a uh, forever uh, duration. And the problem with, um, with that assumption is that spousal support is supposed to be a uh, time-limited uh, type of support that's supposed to allow uh, one spouse who's been disadvantaged during the marriage for whatever reason to be able to get back on their uh, feet and so therefore we uh, call it uh, indefinite support as opposed to being forever support because we don't want people to get the uh, idea that they're going to be receiving spousal support in lieu of having to support themselves at some particular point in time. Yes, indefinite and forever are not synonyms. If the marriage or relationship was what we consider long term, so 30 years, or the parties are of an advanced age, perhaps already in their 70s and retired, it is likely that spousal support will be deemed to be of indefinite duration, but that does not mean that it continues forever. Someone who marries at 20 and then separates at 50 after 30 years together will have an indefinite spousal support entitlement. However, what happens to support when and if the support payer retires at 70 really depends on the particular facts of the case. The support could continue on for life, or it could terminate, or something in between. These are definitely issues to discuss with a lawyer. I wish we had more time to keep discussing these issues, but I just want to thank you, Robert and Megan, for providing a very helpful overview. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Charlene.